Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am very pleased to welcome you to this final talk in J.B. Anderson's series on George Washington. Uh, I want to mention today for anybody who is wondering, um, although this program is going on as scheduled, the library itself is closed today. So we have a, a little display set up, uh, thanks to one of my colleagues, on George Washington at the library, a book display, and I invite you all to come in and take a look at it, but not today and not tomorrow, because the library is closed uh, because of the storm. So today's uh, speaker, uh, J.B. Anderson, is going to finish the series with a final look at George Washington. J.B. Anderson is one of our most popular speakers, and his uh, series on the U.S. presidents is very well known and well loved. Um, J.B.'s appearance today is made possible through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with financial support from the Ramsey County Library Friends. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson, on the final installment of the life of George Washington. Thank you. Today, uh, we're going to talk about a variety of things, so mostly the end of life for uh, George Washington. I'd also, I'll do a reminder a bit deeper into this lecture too, but spring quarter, I will be doing uh, John Adams. It begins Wednesday, March 29th. So uh, first, uh, first thing we're going to talk about is Washington's will and what he said about slavery in his will. He wanted the slaves at Mount Vernon to be freed uh, at the death of his wife, Martha. Uh, but only one ever got freed, and that was his uh, personal valet. Uh, there were 317 slaves at Mount Vernon when Washington died. He owned just 123 of them. Uh, they were the only ones that he really had the power to free because the remaining ones were owned uh, by his wife. And actually, uh, uh, he couldn't manage those slaves at all. And actually, Martha didn't own them either because she was a woman and could not own slaves or other property. They were actually the property of Martha's uh, brothers. Uh, so George had no right to them. Uh, her maiden name was Custis. So it was the Custis males. And they did not support freeing slaves. So Washington could not uh, free the slaves that she brought with her. And uh, he was freeing slaves that the people who owned them said, uh, we don't believe in that. Uh, also, uh, Washington, there was no maintenance of slave families. You might have a husband and a wife, although slaves could not marry, but uh, a husband and his partner, and they might have three or seven children. And then you sell the husband for some reason, or the wife, or half of the children. Uh, so slaves could be sold away from their uh, husband, wife, children, etc., parents, grandparents. Uh, here's a drawing of a slave auction showing a an infant or a very, very young child being held up by an auctioneer, the mother begging that it be kept at the plantation. <clears throat> uh, now, there were slaves that belonged to the Custis family on Washington's plantation, that's Martha. Then there were slaves that belonged to Washington, but they intermixed. So you might have a male slave owned by Washington carries a female slave owned by the Custis family. Uh, 
could Washington save them, keep that family from being broken up? Uh, but that's the reason he didn't free any slaves until after Martha's death. He thought then the whole family could be freed together, not just his slaves, and it would keep slave families together. And he states this, again, we're talking about his will. He states this in his will. Uh, generally, after being uh, freed, if a slave was lucky enough to be freed, they'd have to leave the state they were living in. That would break up a family. So a slave owner could say, I'm going to free the husband here. And, uh, and then the law in most states was, uh, once you're freed, you've got to leave this state. They didn't want you staying around as a freed Black person. Uh, now, in Virginia, this was not the case yet in the 1790s. They passed such a law in 1806. If you're a slave and freed, you have to get out of the state. Uh, so no, I, what he was able to say in his will is uh, uh, none of the slaves have to be removed from the state of Virginia. Other states had such laws. And, he, uh, even though Virginia didn't at the time of Washington's death, he wanted that uh, at these freed slaves that he was freeing in his will to be allowed to stay in Virginia. You can see here from this map of Virginia, West Virginia had not seceded from the state yet. That didn't happen till 1863, the middle of the Civil War. So Virginia was a much larger state at the time uh, than it would be uh, 70 years later. Uh, what do you do with old and infirmed slaves? And uh, Washington talks about this in his will. And uh, he states that they should be cared for until their deaths. And uh, actually, he's just stating something that the state of Virginia required by law. If, uh, if you had slaves who couldn't work due to being very elderly um, and you just released them out into the public, then the state of Virginia would have to take care of them or find some way of them getting food and lodging, et cetera, basic needs. And, um, and that would be, unbearable for the state, according to the politicians there. Uh, so uh, the, the state said, uh, any slaves that get old and infirm are the responsibility of their owner. Uh, Washington and his will says, the young slaves who still have a full life ahead of them should be trained using funds from my estate uh, to have an occupation of some sort. They will not simply uh, be planting and hoeing and weeding and harvesting, et cetera. They won't just be agricultural workers. Train them to have an occupation. Uh, the youngest slaves, those that are not <clears throat> workers yet, They'd start working them probably about the age of five, but at any rate, uh, children of slaves uh, should be taught to read and write. Now, in 1831 in Virginia, a law was passed that you cannot train slaves to read and write. Uh, and that was the law throughout most of the South, most of the slave states. No education, especially reading and writing. Uh, Washington's will, if you typed it up in 12-point type, it would fill 22 pages. And the largest section of his will is about slavery. Uh, if you wanted to print Washington's uh, handwritten will, it would take 44 pages to print it. Uh, you can read his will. <clears throat> I know these... Uh, 
links that I show, such as this one, are difficult to write down, et cetera, get it all correct. All you have to do is go into Google or some other search engine and type in George Washington's will, and it'll take you to it, and they'll have it uh, probably both handwritten and typed out, and you can read the entirety of his will if you're interested. So uh, a lot of the stuff that's in Washington's will about slavery is stuff that he really had no control over. Uh, other people owned most of the slaves at Mount Vernon, and state laws required a great deal of what he said about slaves in his will. So he's simply reinforcing what already exists in terms of ownership and state laws. What was his position personally on slavery? Uh, he was silent. Uh, there are some comments that he made just to other people and in writing, but uh, he was worried that if he spoke out about slavery as a leading politician in the United States, it would increase the divisiveness that already existed between the North and the South. It was an issue that led to a great deal of volatility. So keep quiet about it. Even John Adams did this. Adams was anti-slavery. He was from a free state, Massachusetts, and uh, he was worried, uh, Adams was, about uh, uh, increasing divisiveness if he spoke out about slavery. Washington used slaves as barter. In other words, other than cash. Barter is where you trade one object for another object. So here are 10 of my slaves, and in return, I want 400 acres of your property, uh, for instance. So it was not uncommon for Washington to purchase land, but not with money, not with precious metal, but with slaves. Uh, he had written to several people and uh, was concerned about slavery morally, uh, is it wrong or not? Uh, and uh, throughout his uh, management of Mount Vernon and the slaves that he owned and the ones that um, his wife's brothers owned, he uh, pretty, pretty much managed throughout to keep families intact. So that was a value of his. Were these concerns genuine? Everything we've talked about here, were they based on politics? Hey, I'm obeying the laws of the state. Uh, hey, I'm doing what most slave owners would do. And uh, was he simply trying to satisfy opponents of slavery? If he said and did things that uh, looked like he was concerned about it, that might keep Northern anti-slavery folks uh, quiet. Uh, you know, I want uh, let's do a gradual emancipation, et cetera. You make a few comments like that, and you may simply be silencing your opponents. Uh, Washington may have indeed been a gradualist, wanted the slow ending of slavery. This was commonly talked about even by slave owners. Let's do it over the next 50 years. And uh, there were plans uh, about who to free and how fast and, and how you finally you'd get down to the point where there were no slaves. When he was president, he openly stated that uh, anything done about slavery is an issue of the Congress. It doesn't belong in the executive branch. It's not an issue for presidents to resolve. Uh, basically, what he's doing 
is uh, saying, I can't do anything about it. He's freeing himself from any responsibility about slavery by saying it's something that is controlled by another branch of government, not the one that I am in. Uh, three plans for slavery from uh, people other than Washington. Let's uh, take a look at them. First one is known as the Lafayette Plan. The second one, the Methodist Plan. And the third one, the Society of Friends of Blacks Plan. Uh, this first plan was from the Marquis de Lafayette, a French general. Lafayette was loaned to the United States during our revolution here to be a military leader. And, uh, and he uh, was in the United States for several years as a result. Uh, aiding the U.S. military in actions against the British. And the French did this, of course, because they'd been a longtime enemy of Britain, so any problems they could cause for Britain would be fine. That's who the Marquis de Lafayette is. Let's take a look at his plan. He wanted to buy land in the northeastern section of South America, and he would create in that land that he purchased a uh, place where slaves from the United States uh, could be freed and brought to uh, over a period where slavery would end gradually. Now he bought this land. The, uh, the photo, the picture in the back is a French franc. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, he would use as money. Uh, the land that he purchased today is known as French Guiana. And uh, you can see on the right, it's in the north. Uh, it's um, got that black arrow pointing at it that I inserted there. And you can see it goes from Venezuela to Guiana to Suriname. And then there's French Guiana. Uh, to this day, that is still a part of France. And it's a member of the European Union. And further, as currency, it uses the euro. So this is the land purchased by Lafayette, uh, where uh, United States slaves, once freed, could settle. Washington gave no support to this plan. Uh, the Methodist plan. Uh, this is the Methodist uh, Protestant church sect. Uh, and two the big leaders for this Methodist church, or at least two of them, were Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury. You go into a lot of Methodist churches today, they'll have a room called the Coke Ashbury Room or the Coke Ashbury Library or they might have a plaque to these two men. They were big deals in the Methodist church and anti-slavery. Uh, they issued a petition to be signed by uh, as many people as they could get to sign it that would lead to the abolition of slavery. They approached George Washington with this document and he refused to sign it. The Society of Friends of Blacks plan. Now the Society of Friends, that's Quakers. Okay, it was headed by the gentleman pictured here, Jacques Brissot. He was a Frenchman and he'd come to the United States and he spent a couple of years here and uh, gained contact with a lot of founding fathers and uh, famous people. He wanted to end slavery. That's what he was doing here was uh, promoting the end of slavery for the Quakers, uh, French branch of the Quakers. Washington did not support this plan either. Here's a uh, drawing of Rousseau. Uh, he returned to France, the revolution was in full swing. And, you know, we think of the revolution and it's a kind of a, uh, monopoly, one group, 
that was revolting against the government. The reality was it was several groups. Brachot was the member of one of these groups of revolutionaries. But another group that had greater power didn't like what Brissot's group was doing and saying. They had Brissot arrested. At age 38, he was guillotined and was considered a part of a counter-revolution. We're the real revolutionaries over here in party one. You're in party three and you're working against us. Uh, all of these plans were presented, this is 70 years before slavery actually ended in the United States in 1865. And I would argue it didn't end till 1965 when lots of legislation got passed against Jim Crow laws by Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it was the Jim Crow period. Uh, Washington on slavery, let's take a look at negatives about Washington and slaves. He acquired slaves throughout his life. Uh, he never stopped acquiring slaves. So he continued, I mean, he didn't, he didn't let it die off within his own realm. He kept it uh, active, uh, made no positive response to anti-slavery movements. As a matter of fact, he turned down much of what they were saying and had to do so uh, noticeably. His final address to Congress, his famous farewell address, where he warns about foreign entanglements and other things. In that farewell address, no mention is made of slavery, what to do about it, uh, what his stand is on it, nothing. No mention. Uh, letter, uh, uh, this is a letter that Washington wrote. Uh, let's take a look at it. 1794, now he's still president. He's uh, in his first, uh, in his uh, second term, uh, or that was, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's his second term. And he had a secretary pictured here, Tobias Lear. Uh, today we call these people aides. So he was an aide to Washington. And uh, Washington wrote a letter that um, was addressed to Tobias Lear saying, uh, I'm thinking about freeing my slaves, which he did write in his will he would do, even though you know, he didn't have the power to free most of the slaves at Mount Vernon. Uh, Tobias Lear was, uh, he was related by marriage to Washington. There's no blood relationship. Washington had a nephew and the nephew died and Tobias Lear married that nephew's wife. So he married Washington's nephew's widow. Uh, a lot of arguments are made that, hey, this was a different time, the late 1700s, the 1800s. People had different views about slavery. Uh, you know, it was accepted. Uh, who are we to criticize it today? Uh, those people were living under a different system. This is just simply is not correct. It's totally incorrect. Uh, we've talked a great deal about uh, anti-slavery groups that existed at this time, and they were very vocal. We've talked about attempts to end slavery. Everybody in the United States in the 1700s and, uh, and the 1800s uh, knew about anti-slavery arguments, about anti-slave values associated with anti-slavery, that it was a moral, a political cause, etc. So there was lots of talk about it. This was not a different time where everybody just went okay. Uh, so lots of organizations in the late 1700s that were opposed to slavery. Here's a picture of the cover uh, page or a portion of the cover page from 1787. This is before the United States existed. 
1789 is when the Constitution was approved, or at least the, it was before the Constitution had been approved. And um, I'm going to read this. It just simply says, Constitution of the Pennsylvania Society for promoting the abolition of slavery and the relief of free Negroes unlawfully held in bondage. Uh, Pennsylvania was a Quaker state. Quakers were a society of friends. Uh, they were opposed to slavery. And here's a document that they put out about ending slavery. Washington's last year. Let's look at his finances. He'd been having trouble. He changed his crop from tobacco to corn so he could make whiskey, but the profits from selling whiskey were pretty minimal. It wasn't doing him a great deal of good uh, financially. So he, ended, he really had little money. Now he had a lot of land in Ohio. There were these wars, and he was a general in them, known as the Northwest Territory War. It's also known as the Ohio Territory. And in payment for fighting off the Native Americans in that area and gaining control of that land that became uh, four or five states, uh, in payment for being a general in that war, he received land in Ohio as opposed to money. Soldiers received the same thing. They received a whole lot less land, but they were living in other places. They didn't want a few acres in Ohio. Uh, they weren't about to move there. Uh, so Washington bought up at very low prices the land that soldiers owned there. So he owned a tremendous amount of land in Ohio, but that gave him no income. Some people moving further west then in, uh, into the Northwest Territory would simply be squatters on land that was owned by both Native Americans and by uh, white people. And Washington's land was basically taken over by squatters. His net worth at his death in 1799, he had $30,000. Now by inflation in 2020, that's about $600,000. Uh, today, lots of professional people retiring have that amount of money uh, in uh, IRAs, et cetera, uh, or savings accounts or retirement funds and so on. Uh, but um, uh, this was still a great deal of money in Washington's day. Washington's last year, last years, uh, when John Adams became president, he was elected in 1796, he appointed Washington a general. So Washington's now retired from the presidency, and uh, the second president, Adams, appoints him as a uh, general. Uh, the concern was we might end up having trouble from France. Uh, the Adams was a big supporter of England because we could trade with them. Even though France had helped us during our revolution, they were not a significant trading partner like England was. So the fact that we were making overtures to England uh, of a financial nature there was concern this would lead to difficulties with the French. And the French were located in Canada. Uh, Quebec was a French colony. So the French had easy access for invading the United States. So Adams appoint, he says, we need generals. And Adams uh, appointed Washington and Washington accepted. But uh, the threat never developed. Washington had nothing to do militarily after he left the presidency, and uh, he held that position until uh, he died of general, uh, which was 17 months after the appointment occurred, his death. He went out looking over his property uh, for an extended period. It was in December of 1790, so it was a colder part of the year. When he got back, 
He complained about tightness in his chest, chest congestion. He, he couldn't take deep breaths and he had a sore throat. Here's a painting of Washington on his deathbed, uh, surrounded by relatives and medical doctors uh, looking to care for him. Uh, one of the doctors thought he had something more serious than just a cold, you know, a sore throat, a cough, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, the diagnosis that the doctor came up with is that Washington had what in his day was called Quincy. And uh, this is a tonsil infection. There's a normal throat on the upper, uh, the upper left of the two images. Then the lower left images show a tonsil infection. You can see how these organs or these uh, tonsils here became diseased down here. And uh, it made a significant change in his speech. And he complained about throat pain. He had a fever that went with it, which would indicate uh, uh, something more serious than just a cold. Could not fully open his mouth uh, due to the extended size of the tonsils in part, and he would um, spit out into a cloth and there was uh, pus in the cloth. So these tonsils were greatly infected. Well, what are we gonna do about it? Well, this is an indication that he has bad blood in him, so we gotta get that blood out of him and that'll cure the illness. Uh, I won't show anything about bloodletting, uh, the actual performance of it, but here are the tools that are used. Uh, doctors carried a device like this on the left that folded inward, and these portions that stick out, they would be held against the, the skin and then pushed in. And that's how you could create an opening and drain blood out. Here are in the lower right, our other instruments look very similar, but they're, they're single bladed instruments that were used for bloodletting also. Here's a pint of beer, that's 16 ounces. Washington was bled to a total of five pints of beer and 16 ounces per pint. You're, we're looking at a tremendous amount of blood loss <clears throat> aided uh, this really aided in his death human body contains about 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of blood so nearly half the blood was drained from his body uh, that'll kill you uh, one of the younger doctors that was servicing washington had learned about tracheotomies which uh, were a a new procedure. Somebody has trouble breathing, as Washington was. You uh, make a slit in their throat and insert a tube uh, down into the uh, trachea area there, and they can breathe more easily or breathing through their neck, in essence. Uh, well, Washington died. It was two days after he returned from his inspection of his property. Here is the uh, burial site. <clears throat> it is uh, Washington on the left or on the right and Martha on the left. Uh, Washington was very concerned about being buried alive. Uh, frequently uh, tombs would be opened after a person had died and they could see that the person had moved in there. They had things under their fingernails from trying to remove the uh, top of the casket. And um, uh, consequently, Washington got very concerned about this. He said, I don't wanna be buried the next day, which was common practice. Wait three days, have someone sitting at my coffin and watching me. Well, they waited four days and then entombed him. Uh, 
modern cause of his death. What does medicine say today? Uh, there's three items here. One is he was bled to death, which was the practice at the time. One of the practices for curing diseases was to get rid of bad blood. Uh, hypovolemic shock is another cause of death. Uh, your heart can't pump blood. And this is caused by fluid loss. Okay, what kind of fluid had he lost? Uh, you know, something like 40% of his blood. Uh, organs stop working with less fluid, uh, known as hypovolemic shock. And third, epiglottitis. Uh, this is a flap at the back of your throat, and I'll show you a larger picture of it here in a second. Becomes infected, makes breathing very difficult. Now on the left here, this is the epiglottis, and you can see how it can close off between the mouth and the trachea there. And this is a larger image of it. Uh, this is the smaller portion down here. So this was a problem also. Uh, if that swells or uh, gets disformed in some way, deformed, a uh, person can die from it. His eulogy, probably the most uh, famous eulogy, certainly in U.S. history, was delivered by this man who was a general in the American Revolution, Henry Lee. Uh, certainly one of the most famous speeches in US history. First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Uh, Lee served uh, in the military with George Washington during the War for Independence, more commonly called the American Revolution. And he was, his nickname was Light Horse Harry. Uh, Washington was a Mason. So there were Masonic rituals at his funeral. Uh, Masons took some part in the, in the funeral. Uh, side point, Henry Lee, who delivered uh, this eulogy for uh, Washington, was Robert E. Lee's father. And Robert E. Lee's, Robert E. Lee, the famous Southern general, married Mary Custis, who was the great granddaughter of Martha Washington. And this is a picture of Mary Custis, Mrs. Robert E. Lee, uh, and uh, Martha Washington's great granddaughter. Uh, this is the Lee Custis Mansion. It's located in Arlington National Cemetery. Robert E. Lee owned a great deal of property right across the Potomac River from the White House. When the Civil War started, it was very easy for the North to conquer this territory. Uh, as deaths mounted in uh, the civil, the American Civil War, uh, they started looking around for burial places and they said, look at all this land around Robert E. Lee's mansion. And it became and is today Arlington National Cemetery. And this uh, building, this home of theirs still stands there. Uh, you can visit it. And there's still lots of room for burials at Arlington National Cemetery, and we are 160 years beyond it having been taken over by the North. Washington's burial. Uh, there was a family vault at uh, Mount Vernon, but it was falling apart. It was in uh, horrible repair, and uh, Washington in his will said, uh, I want a new vault built. Uh, we need something uh, that's a lot more stable than the old vault that contained the body of many of his ancestors. Uh, eventually, the older vault got vandalized. Washington family then built a new one 
Uh, this was uh, in 1837. This is 38 years after George Washington had died that this new vault was built. This is the one that contained just Washington, George, and Martha. Uh, and there are other areas uh, in this building that contain the uh, vaults of people who had been, whose graves had been vandalized. Uh, Congress said, no, we want him buried here. We don't want him buried at Mount Vernon. We want him buried in the United States Capitol. So Congress built this vault in the U.S. Capitol. And then uh, there was a conflict among congressmen about uh, what if the North and the South become separate nations someday? This is 1832. So they're worried, you know, uh, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of division. Uh, you're gonna end up with a president of the United States being buried in the South. Uh, what do we do about that? Now, what's crazy about this is Mount Vernon's in the South. That's where he was buried anyway. So what's the problem? We're going to take a look at uh, Marson, uh, uh, Parson Weems' fables. Uh, this is an interesting character here. This is Mason Locke Weems' drawing of him. In 1800, less than a year after Washington's death, he wrote a biography of Washington. Now he went by the name Parson Weems, but he was not a clergyman. He uh, was a book dealer. He'd buy books uh, in Europe, have them shipped here, sell them through a store here in the United States. And so he was a book dealer, not a clergyman, but is known today as Parson Weems. His book on the life of George Washington, here's a couple different versions of it. It's still in print. You can buy it on Amazon or any other website. You can order it through, uh, you know, stores. Uh, on the left, you have uh, a very modern looking edition of it. And it's got a foreword by a historian. On the right, you've got, uh, it's a modern edition also, but made to look old. It looks like it's leather and so on. Mason Locke Weems, The Life of George Washington. Uh, many of the stories that uh, Weems wrote about in this biography of George Washington are apocryphal. Apocryphal stories are ones that cannot be proven to be true. Uh, in the case of Weems, these are outright lies. They're things that never happened. A lot of things that we're very familiar with. Uh, I'm gonna read this. George, this is from the book. George, said his father. Do you know who killed that beautiful little cherry tree yonder in the garden? This was a tough question. And George staggered under it for a moment, but quickly recovered himself. And looking at his father with the sweet face of youth, brightened with the inexpressible charm of all conquering truth, he bravely cried out, I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know, I can't tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. Run to my arms, you dearest boy cried his father in transports, that's slacks, or uh, run to my arms, glad am I, George, that you killed my tree, for you have paid me for it a thousandfold. Uh, Washington never learned the basic lesson of childhood, how to tell a lie. Mark Twain said this around 1900. And uh, it's not a true story. The book uh, was read in schools. 
It was standard reading for children. It would teach children what is right. Uh, whoops. Uh, this book would be allowed in Florida today. Uh, as we all know, Florida's banned all sorts of things, but this tells the kind of story Florida wants to hear, or at least that its governor wants people to hear. Uh, here's a painting of Washington looking very much like an adult, but in small size. And uh, here is the uh, confrontation between dad and child about the cherry tree. Uh, there's a larger version of it. The title of this is Parson Weems's Fable. And it's by Grant Wood, who's an Iowa artist. Spent his life uh, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He would drive south to Iowa City where he taught art for a few years. Uh, this particular painting is in the Ammon Carter Museum located in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's a great visit. You go down to Cedar Rapids. It's the second largest city in Iowa after Des Moines. And there's a uh, museum in town and it has uh, 200 Grant Wood uh, paintings. And you go about 10 blocks from the museum and there's a carriage house. Carriages were kept on the bottom part and people could live in the top of it. And when, when Grant Wood was alive back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, a rich man in town who owned that uh, mansion, and he also owned the, that carriage house, told Grant Wood, you can come and live here for free. And you can tour the upstairs part, uh, see where Grant Wood li lived, where he kept his paintings. It's a, I think it's about a thousand square feet. Very interesting. Um, I went there with my wife. We sat there, talked to the one of the tour guides uh, for quite a time. They'll spend a good bit of time with you, so on. This is the most famous painting by Grant Wood called American Gothic. It's in the Chicago Art Institute Museum. Uh, it's one of the three most recognizable paintings worldwide. They include The Last Supper, The Mona Lisa, and this, American Gothic. The difference between this painting and The Last Supper and Mona Lisa is people don't know the name of it and they don't know who painted it. They know that, generally speaking, for The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa. And again, Art Institute of Chicago. I went there to see it. Uh, I was at a convention for um, uh, Organization of American Historians. So I walked over to see this thing thinking that I'd get in free. And this is back, I think it was about 1990. And uh, they wanted $10 admission fee. And I thought, what? I mean, it just was a lot of money then. I'm out of town having to spend a thousand dollars of my own, uh, uh, you know, I uh, cost a lot more than that to send me to this conference, but there were things I needed to pay for also. And I thought, oh, the heck with it. And I just walked out. So I never did get to see it. Kind of stupid, I should have spent the 10 bucks. Uh, here are the models for this painting. The woman here is Grant Wood's sister. And this gentleman was Grant Wood's dentist. Both of them were concerned, will people be able to recognize us? And Grant Wood uh, assured them, no, no one will be able to recognize you. Ah, look at the, and, the painting is not uh, a man and his wife. It's a man and his maiden daughter. And here are the two of them standing next to the painting uh, taken in black and white. 
So anyway, uh, kind of a side story, interesting side story about uh, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree and Grant Wood of Iowa paint, uh, did a painting of it. Uh, if you can't lie, then you should steer clear of politics, George. Uh, a lot of people say you should steer clear of life. <laughs> George Winkington is what uh, came to be called as a result of this story about um, chopping down the cherry tree. Another lie involves Betsy Ross. He met with Betsy Ross and to to together they designed the first American flag. And here's a painting of uh, Betsy Ross with one of her cohorts and a child and Washington with a couple of probably colonels or other generals. And they're deciding on the design of the United States flag. Now, Ross was indeed a seamstress. She was an upholsterer, made uh, cushions for furniture also. They never met. There's no record of the two of them ever meeting. Uh, Washington kept records about every place he visited. Uh, it was not until 1870, so it's nearly 100 years after the American flag came out, her ancestors got together and they made an announcement. Betsy met with George and they designed the American flag. Well, it just never happened. And the whole story is based on uh, her descendants a hundred years after the incident occurred. She did make flags and she made flags for the Navy. They would fly them on board their ships. And she did this during the revolution, but she was one of many flag makers. And she made flags for the Navy for 50 years after the American Revolution. Uh, there's no evidence of a meeting with Washington. There's no evidence of payments for creating the flag. Here is a record for making a flag. An order by William Webb to Elizabeth Ross, 14 pounds and 12 shillings and two pence to make ship colors put into William Richards store where they could be sold. Uh, so we know she made flags. That is the extent of uh, the story. Washington had wooden teeth. No, he didn't. Wooden teeth chip very easily. They splinter. People needed much harder substances for teeth. Now, wooden teeth were uh, tried at one time, and in some areas, uh, countries in Europe, they were used and regularly replaced, uh, but uh, they were never used in the Americas. So. Well, what did Washington have? He had teeth made from ivory, and it was the ivory of three different animals that were used elephants, hippopotamus, and walrus ivory. And it wasn't just ivory. Some of the teeth were real teeth. They had been extracted from other people and then used in a set of dentures. So ivory and real teeth. This is Washington's dentures. You can see they're gold-plated. They have a string. Uh, the roof of the mouth is uh, gold-plated. And you can see that they're carved uh, here. There's upper and lower teeth. Um, and I, darn, I should have written this down, but I can't remember where they're on display. Anyway, these are Washington's actual dentures. Uh, portraits of Washington. He's always got his mouth shut. Looks like this. If he opened his mouth, you'd see fake teeth. Didn't like wearing the teeth, except when you're eating, because they're difficult. So you would sit with your mouth shut. Well, another argument here, in addition to keeping your mouth shut because you don't have any teeth, 
is uh, who can smile for two hours straight while you're sitting for an artist. He lived in the White House. Nope, there was no White House yet. First president to live there was John Adams. White House was uh, being built uh, when Washington was president during some of his last years. Here's what it looked like when John Adams moved into it. Quite different. There's no porticos. Those are the large areas on uh, one side and the back and and uh, you can walk out onto this huge terrace and it's got railings on it. That's a portico. There's no West Wing. Oh, those porticos were added in 1829. There's no West Wing. That's where all the offices are located now. Uh, the Oval Office, the Office of AIDS. There are offices in the West Wing for the press. Um, and that was done in 1909, and that was Teddy Roosevelt that did that. Teddy Roosevelt moved into the White House. He was uh, the youngest president, and he had children. And children are running around in there, his sons and his daughter, and, and he just went, I can't take this. I'm trying to do business in a place where we live, and there's all these kids running around. So he said, get a plan going here. So they planned special offices <clears throat> for the president, his aides, and the press, today known as the West Wing. And it was, uh, I think it was completed, not started, in 1909. And there were no bomb shelters. Now there's bomb shelters underneath the White House. They were added during World War II. You have to go 120 feet below ground. Uh, and, uh, and then you, that's, uh, that's about 12 stories below ground. And then there are six stories of space where people can live and work. Uh, so you're going 18, basically 18 stories below ground. Uh, here's a six story building in this graphic. It just shows you the size of the working area that was created uh, during World War II underneath the White House. Uh, Donald Trump was in the bomb shelter once, and it was during the Black Lives Matter march in Washington, D.C. They figured he needed to be kept in a safe place during that particular event. <clears throat> He prayed at Valley Forge. There are lots of drawings and paintings about this. Again, remember, we're talking about Parson Weems's uh, uh, book on uh, George Washington, uh, his life of George Washington. And uh, he talks about Washington praying in the woods at Valley Forge. Uh, Washington didn't pray. He didn't take communion even. He did attend a church occasionally, and he was criticized publicly and in a sermon by the clergyman, and he got up and walked out for not taking communion. Uh, he was a deist, uh, believes in God, probably did not believe in the divinity of Christ, which was common among deists. Uh, many of the first founding fathers were deists. Our first Christian president was number seven, Andrew Jackson. Uh, the two Adamses, uh, John and John Quincy, were Unitarians, um, and the remainder were deists. Um, so here's a, here's a painting of Washington doing something described by Weems uh, that he never did, and that's praying. Here's the... Uh, a drawing of Washington praying based on the Parson Weems tale. Here's some soldiers. What the heck is this character? We'll talk about it in a second. Here's an image, a, a statue of Washington praying with his horse. 
And there's another image, Valley Forge, 1777, Washington praying. Uh, I want to go back real quick. Okay. Um, what uh, what Parson Weems did is he said there was a Quaker, a man who's a member of the Society of Friends, and he reported this story to me. He saw Washington actually praying in the woods. Quakers, uh, uh, the Society of Friends, they tend to be pacifists. They'll go into the military, but only as pacifists. Uh, and uh, this uh, Isaac Potts, who is Weems credited with seeing Washington praying in the woods. He, uh, Weems says Potts stated that uh, this changed his mind about the war. Quakers are anti-war. And after that, Potts supported the Revolutionary War. So here's a <clears throat> here's that same painting again, and I've expanded this section to show in this painting Isaac uh, uh, Potts standing and watching Washington pray. But again, uh, this is something that never never happened. It's hogwash. Say, talking about hogwash, another reminder, spring quarter begins March 29th. Uh, I will be doing uh, John Adams. Hope to see you all there. Okay, great military leader. Uh, during the French and Indian Wars, Washington attacked a French fort it led to huge losses for the British forces. French and Indian War was done at the time that the uh, United States was colonies. They were not the United States. And uh, the outcome of this battle was embarrassing to Washington. And uh, he ended up resigning from the British military. Uh, he may have been asked to even. Uh, he wore a wig. It's not true. Uh, a lot of people wore wigs, white wigs at the time. Washington used his own hair, but then had it powdered uh, to turn it white. Uh, so uh, many people powdered their hair. A guy who rebelled against all this, never wore white wig or powdered hair, was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he was the founding father without the wig or the powdered hair. But here's a drawing of Washington uh, with some paint added to it, uh, showing him with a white, uh, white hair. I've often wondered, all that powder in the hair, I wonder how much of it comes out and it ends up on your uniform or your whatever you're wearing. Could have been kind of a mess, I would think. Silver dollar. Uh, Washington threw a silver dollar across the Potomac uh, River. There are people that wrote about this, including Parson Weems. Uh, the dates are 1775 and 1799. We're not certain when it happened. The first silver dollar to be minted was 1794. Uh, Washington was president. It was not during the American Revolution that he could have done this because silver dollars did not exist then. And the dates given are 1775-1779 during the American Revolution. There was no dollar coin till 1794. And then when they were released, it was in a small number and mostly to wealthy people who gave them as gifts, not as spending money. And here's a picture of that 1794 uh, silver dollar called the Liberty Silver Dollar. That's the side with, that's uh, the head's side. 
Uh, the area on the Potomac River that people wrote about where Washington threw this uh, silver dollar that didn't exist for 20 more years across the Potomac River, it's one mile wide at that spot. There's, it's impossible for a human to throw anything for one mile. Um, this is a story that was probably told in order to make Washington appear to be superhuman. Uh, don't feel bad, Mr. Washington. A dollar just doesn't go as far as it used to. Political cartoon from our own age. An overall evaluation of Washington by William Isaacson, who's a historian, he says, Washington was made of stone. He seldom said much. He just stood there. He was an imposing figure because he was uh, six inches taller than anybody else uh, during his day. And uh, he generally didn't have a great deal to say. Consequently, this quote, Washington was made of stone. And that is, that's the end. Now, uh, we have several minutes left. So, Judy, uh, we'll, do yes, what we, we'll do what we can if there are some questions. And uh, uh, yes, there you, are you a might, few questions. Uh, you might have to close up early. Okay. Well, we'll go as far as we can with the questions. Before we, I start reading the questions, though, since we do have a little extra time, I wanted to ask myself about the origins of the fashion that uh, Washington followed of powdering his hair. Apparently you said Benjamin Franklin was the great exception. So why did everybody else do it? What was the origins of that fashion? I think one reason is it made you look old and wise. Uh -huh. You know, cause yeah. now you've got gray hair or white hair. And, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of these guys were pretty young during the American revolution. Uh, some mm -hmm. were in their twenties. Uh, many in their 30s. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so these were not old folks, with the exception of Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin mm -hmm. Franklin wore a fur cap mm -hmm. over his long hair. He didn't have it up and curled either. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was another exception that he made. And uh, people loved, uh, loved that. They loved the look of him. He, it was so different that uh, that helped and it would be interesting uh, I'm going to raise a couple questions uh, what kind of powder did they use you know we've recently uh, uh, been warned about using talcum powder which I used as a kid all the time my parents yeah. used it and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a cancer producing agent uh, today yeah mm -hmm. and, I wonder what kind of powder they used, if it was talc or not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the whiting, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That answers a question, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to start the questions in the Q&A line, um, why was only one of the slaves Washington owned freed after Martha's death three years later? I think you said... One was freed at Washington's death, his personal valet. Yeah. And then uh, were, when were others freed or, or were others freed after Martha's death? Well, they weren't freed. Uh -huh. Yeah, they were sold off by the family uh, mm -hmm. to, to a large extent. Uh, more than half went back to the Custis family, the males mm -hmm. in the Custis family. And... Uh, Mm -hmm. And Martha was looked after until her death uh, by relatives. Um, and that I think the reason that the uh, valet was freed was, uh, and there's been research done about this. Uh, Gunnar mm -hmm. Murdahl, a Swedish sociologist, did research about uh, why the hatred between races. And it was used in the 1954, his research was in the 54 Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Topeka 
about uh, the uh, integration of schools. And that what Murdahl pointed out is that contact makes a difference. If you're around people of another race, you have a different opinion of them than people who are separated from them. And it's positive versus negative in many situations. Now, Washington's valet, that's somebody that was mighty close to him. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody that he knew. Yeah. Um, so I would argue that it was that closeness that uh, allowed mm -hmm. that particular slave to be freed. Um, mm -hmm. And and the uh, the interesting thing uh, about it again I'll repeat it is uh, mm -hmm. uh, association makes a difference in relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A questioner uh, wants to know how much longer did Martha Washington live after George Washington died. Yeah, I'll have to look that. It's, it wasn't uh, very long. Uh, Would you like me to look at? She did not <laughs> attend his funeral. Uh, she was so shaken by his death that uh, she stayed home. Uh, she died eight, May, May 22nd, 1802. So it's like mm -hmm. three years later. Yeah. But uh, she she was so shaken by his death. They did march his coffin in front of mm -hmm. Mount Vernon, and she was able to look out a window at that mm -hmm. parade. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah uh, she lived uh, mm -hmm. okay. lived several uh, about three years after his death. Okay. And another question, uh, how many Black people moved to French Guiana after Lafayette uh, purchased the land? Uh, none. Uh, yeah, it, it never happened. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a movement where uh, slaves were taken to another land, freed slaves. And uh, this was a society that was founded in the early uh, 1800s and didn't, and it did not uh, shut down its doors until 1964, about 150 mm -hmm. years after it was founded. And it was a back to Africa movement. Mm -hmm. And they purchased the land that today is the country of Liberia, which means mm -hmm. liberty. And mm -hmm. it was black slaves that populated that area. James uh, Monroe supported this movement. He was our fourth pre uh, president, uh, fifth president. Mm -hmm. And the capital of uh, Liberia is Monrovia, named for James mm -hmm. Monroe. Uh, mm -hmm. So there, there were movements similar to uh, Lafayette's that uh, were that did indeed uh, transport people, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the most successful one was a back to Africa group. Okay, how popular was the anti-slavery movement in the North compared to the South? Uh, I don't have figures on that. I don't know that any even exist. There were lots of people that were outspoken about it. And mm -hmm. there were lots of, there were newspapers that were started that were anti-slavery. William Lloyd Garrison uh, was mm -hmm. a famous Northern spokesman who founded a newspaper called The Liberator. And he um, uh, just spoke out against slavery very strongly. Uh, 30 years before it ended. I mean, he was doing this work in the 1830s. Uh, and uh, there were politicians who were opposed to it and spoke out about it. Uh, James uh, John Adams was opposed to slavery, but said very little about it. Um, 
what the percentage of people was. I, I would guess the vast majority went oh hum, you know, not interested, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, uh, maybe the way a, a way to ask this question is: Was there any popularity of the anti-slavery movement in the South at all? Oh, Were there abolitionists in the South? Yes, but uh -huh. uh, they dare not say much. Yeah. In the modern world, with Jim Crow laws like crazy, mm -hmm. when uh, William Clinton, the former president, well, his mother was off to nursing school, and she left him for a couple of years with her parents, mm -hmm. and they were in the Deep South. Uh, it's where he was born and raised. And mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> his grandparents uh, told him about being quiet, but uh, be nice to these Black people and uh, their suffering, et cetera, et cetera. It's an example of people in the South having mm -hmm. to uh, watch their tongues. And this is in the 1940s and 50s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, watch what you say, et cetera, but uh, mm -hmm. they were lying low. And of course, the Underground Railroad existed in the South. Uh, mm -hmm. Slaves could find the right place and be sheltered there. And then at night, moved a few miles north and sheltered there. And that's mm -hmm. what the Underground Railroad was about. Uh, and it's... Uh, uh, you know, credit goes to a black woman, but there were lots of white people in the South that uh, provided mm -hmm. those shelters also for blacks escaping slavery. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, next question. We know uh, that... Uh, I should have... But I'm I will... Sorry. Yeah, I will look that up and... Uh, uh, add a slide or two about it. Mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Can you comment on the movement to replace Washington, uh, I guess, as the general of the army during the Revolutionary War? Was there a movement like that? I don't know of one, no. Okay. During the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. no. I guess maybe the there was a movement that he because he performed so badly in the French and Indian War. I wonder if the uh, questioner is referring to that. Well, it was the uh, you know he was appointed to be the general probably because mm -hmm. of his past experience, even though it was negative, and mm -hmm. he was young, so a lot of people would write that off. Uh, yeah, from the French and mm -hmm. Indian Wars and. And uh, those Northwest Territory mm -hmm. War, mm -hmm. uh, okay. but uh, uh, he was appointed by the, uh, you know, the uh, the Articles of Confederation is what we operated under from 1776, basically. It might have been 77 until mm -hmm. 1789 when the Constitution was adopted by the states. So it was that uh, Confederate Congress, not to be confused with the Civil War, that appointed yes. him general during the American Revolution. And uh, <clears throat> um, I, I, I don't, I, I, there's probably people that didn't like him, but I know of no movement to have him replaced. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, another question, I remember hearing when we're talking about myths in Washington, I remember hearing that Washington also didn't cross the Delaware, as was depicted in the famous painting. Uh, I guess that was on Christmas Eve. He was supposed to have crossed the, is that right? Or Christmas Day? Oh, um, yeah, well, that, that was foolish of me to leave that out. I wonder why uh -huh. I didn't think of that. Yeah, he's standing up in a boat and crossing the Delaware River. And... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have to be an idiot to stand up in a boat, uh, not simply because you'll make the boat rock, but yeah. you'll target them. Mm -hmm. uh, if the enemy's on the other shore and you're bringing troops across to try to yeah. take over that side of the river, uh, yeah. you want to be hunkered down in the boat 
<laughs> is it is it possible that he crossed the river but sitting down you know? yeah. or is the whole story a myth <laughs> i i just uh i don't know okay it's uh right. yeah i uh i think the painting certainly is but uh -huh. i'd have to look up whether he ever actually crossed the delaware river or not okay um we know that Washington didn't leave any legitimate children. He had no children with his wife, Martha. Uh, this person wants to know, is it known if Washington fathered any illegitimate children uh, whose mothers were uh, enslaved? Uh, no, uh, he, he probably did not father any. He had a disease as a young man that mm -hmm. commonly causes infertility. Oh, so, so it, it is assumed that he was incapable of fathering children. I see. Uh, now, there's lots of stories about uh, slave mistresses with Washington. Uh, there's one person who contends his illness was really a venereal disease that he probably picked up from mm -hmm. uh, having sex with slave women. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, when I do Thomas Jefferson, uh, probably, a, you know, a year from now, roughly or mm -hmm. so, he had a 40 year relationship and six children with a slave mistress. And yes. I watched this um, Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates on Channel mm -hmm. 2 on Tuesday nights. And he's had a lot of uh, Black people who he traces. Uh, uh, you know, their African American history here in the States. And, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and there's uh, the slave owner records uh, show that uh, the owners, people we've never heard of, but people who own slaves or plantations, etc., were having relationships. There's letters they left behind. Uh -huh. they, they freed the woman they were closest to, uh, mm -hmm. the children that they had, et cetera. Uh, just uh, last night, uh, he had um, a man on there, J-E-H was his first name. And they traced... Uh, they mm -hmm. traced his uh, lineage back to a slave owner. Now with DNA uh, yeah. evidence, right? It's very easy, yeah. I would think. Yeah. Uh, and another thing that makes it possible with DNA evidence, even though you mm -hmm. can't dig up a grave, et cetera, yes. frequently mm -hmm. that's forbidden, or even if you could, you couldn't extract DNA. What happened mm -hmm. is in those days when people got haircuts, They'd save mm -hmm. the hair mm -hmm. and they'd put it in little packets or they'd tie it together with a piece of hair. So you'd have a little hanging mm -hmm. thing of hair and they'd give it to people. So mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're doing nowadays is these DNA experts go around and say, uh, you, you own uh, 16 of George Washington's haircuts. So can I have a strand of hair from mm -hmm. each one? Mm -hmm. uh, it was, there was a dentist, I think he was a Swedish dentist, and I can't remember the name of the book. And he went around and collected Napoleon's hair sample mm -hmm. and tested it. And he found there was a lot of arsenic poisoning and that, uh, there was a representative of the royal family in France living with Napoleon on this mm -hmm. island. And, um, and that there were, he could tell from the hair samples when Napoleon was given, uh, you know, arsenic was added to his wine. Yeah. He says yeah. uh, Napoleon died of arsenic poisoning. Oh, I I am. Okay, um, let's see. Well, we're, we're running out of time here, but we've got a few more questions. Let's see if we can fit them all in. How motivated Northerners to be uh, opposed to slavery? Uh, yeah, well, in a large part, it was morality. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, 
to an even larger part, religion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and other and uh, humanitarian efforts and other parts. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty much the same things that motivate people today to do acts mm -hmm. of decency, you know. Okay. Uh, did we have a president during the Articles of Confederation? Yes. Uh, we had several of them. Uh, uh -huh. the, the first president of the uh, freed colonies or, or the colonies in the American Revolution. I think his name was John Anderson, but you can look mm -hmm. up, uh, just uh, type in uh, 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 U.S. Confederacy presidents. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was an election every year or an appointment or something. Uh, mm -hmm. So there were, there were several of them and it's all people I can't even remember the names. And it's all people we've never heard of, you know. Okay. Just doesn't get taught. We're out of time. We're over time. Um, please Thanks. join us again when we start again with John Adams on uh, March 29th. That's about, um, I guess, a month from now. We look forward to seeing you all at that time. But for today, thank you very much. And I'll say goodbye. Thank you.